sometimes I run across a little tiny clue, and that little tiny clue has some pretty big implications in terms of being evidential, in terms of proving something. So that happened to me recently. I ran across an, a comment by the publishers in this January 1st, 1831 edition of the New York Constellation. And there it is. I just happened to have, I have like five copies of this paper, and I just so happened to have this edition. I'll put it up on the screen. And um, what we find is the publishers give us a little note under the editorial column on the second page. And they say, Dr. Green, having resumed the editorial charge of the Constellation, it will in future be conducted by him as principal editor, assisted by the gentleman who has furnished the editorial matter for the last three numbers. And there's the signature of the publishers, Lord and Bartlett. Now, I have to give uh, a little background on this. And this is extrapolated from a great many clues, which would take me hours to try to present. So I'm not going to present all the background evidence, but I am not going off half-cocked. I do, in fact, have that evidence. So Matthew, as a boy, he'd run away from home for the last time at age 14. He'd gone to Boston. He'd worked in Boston for a while, and then he went to New York City. He was writing for three Two major newspapers and one minor one, I would say. The Boston um, New England Galaxy, he was writing for. And then uh, he was also in New York City. He wrote for the Inquirer. But in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, he was writing for Asa Green. We're talking 1826 and 1827 when Matthew was 14 years old. The name of the paper was the Berkshire American. Then in 1829, Asa Green went to New York City, established the Constellation, the paper I just showed you. That went for two, three years. As of, that, that was 1829, maybe December. As of mid-1830, at least, by my estimation, Matthew was the actual de facto editor of that paper, while Asa Green was busy running his bookstore there in New York City. So he turned it over to Matthew, but he continued to officially be the editor-in-chief. What we have here is evidence that someone was officially given charge of the paper for three weeks, which is to say the December 11, December 18, and December 25, the Christmas, Christmas edition, in 1830. And then the publishers tell us that as of January 1st, 1831, Asa Green took official charge of the paper. That doesn't mean he really was editing it. It means that he was either indisposed or went on a trip somewhere for three weeks, and he officially handed over the paper to Matthew during that time. And then when he came back or he got well, he officially took it back over again. But it's when, So when they say that this unnamed gentleman would continue to assist what they really mean was that Matthew would be running the paper as he had been for several months, but that Asa Green was back officially in charge, and Matthew now had relinquished the official charge of the paper back over to Green. It's not what it sounds. But what we have now is evidence in these three editions. We know that basically, and unless Green left things on file, which is possible, but we have a pretty strong indication that nothing in these three editions of the 11th, the 18th, and the 25th were written by Asa Green. And that all of this material, including the editorial material, all the material that was written originally for this paper during those three weeks was written by this unnamed gentleman who would continue to assist. Well, so far as I know, there's no list of like the staff of the Constellation, so we can't go there. <laughs> and I know of no private correspondence that would shed any light on it. But there's a lot of clues that this is Matthew Franklin Whittier because I have a whole bunch of his other work from before and afterwards to compare it to. So what we're going to do is to look at these three editions and look for signs of Matthew Franklin Whittier's authorship. Now, there's ramifications for this. Let's say that there's a particular type of story that's in these three editions. We know that this unnamed gentleman who 
I can essentially prove was Matthew. We know he wrote those. That means that everywhere in this paper that you see that, that's probably Matthew. Now, it's kind of interesting that as of this January 1st, 1831 edition, a couple things start to happen. Matthew starts to sign with the single letter D, as well as writing unsigned work for the paper, but he starts using D. And uh, he also starts writing a series of letters from a country bumpkin who had come to the city, which was Matthew's favorite theme, named Enoch Timbertoes. Neither of those were Asa Green's work. But for now, we're going to look at these three last, last editions in 1830. So um, these have very strong implications for other things. And uh, the first one is that Matthew wrote in 1832 and before, but in particular in 1832, he wrote very strongly against debtor's prison. And then he wrote a novel about debtor's prison, which was published in 1834 after he had left the Constellation. Uh, Asa Green started a new paper in, uh, I think it was 1835, 1834, maybe, uh, called The Transcript. But in between, in between when the Constellation ended and the transcript started, Matthew wrote five novels, short novels, including The Debtor's Prison. It was called The Debtor's Prison, A Tale of a Revolutionary Soldier. And this is significant because this shows that Matthew was writing social reform literature well before Charles Dickens ever did. And in particular, he was writing about poverty and debtor's prison long before Charles Dickens ever did. And then you have to realize that these New York papers would have been available in England. That means that Charles Dickens could have been influenced by Matthew Franklin Whittier before he ever started writing social commentary. Okay? And it's not as far-fetched as it sounds. People in England would read New York City papers. So um, we're going to look at some of these. We're going to look at these three editions, and then I'm going to point out specific elements of them that are pointing to Matthew and pointing to his authorship. Because now we have a tie-in, you know. Now there's another tie-in, and that is that in, I think it's 1831, Matthew starts printing. As the de facto editor of this paper, The Constellation, he starts printing the poetry and prose of two particular people. One of them is Oliver Wendell Holmes, and one of them is his brother, John Greenleaf Whittier, who was publishing in the local Haverhill Gazette or whatever it was. See? So he was giving his brother a leg up. He was giving his brother publicity in New York City, and he was doing the same thing for Oliver Wendell Holmes. Now, Matthew's style and Oliver Wendell Holmes' style was very similar. I could show you any number of pieces here that Matthew wrote in the Constellation and earlier, which sound very much like the autocrat of the breakfast table, which appeared in the November 1831 edition of New England Magazine, which was a journal that Matthew was publishing in. And, and they would have had a very similar, very compatible sense of humor. So it's absolutely unnatural that they would have been friends. After all, Matthew traveled in the same circles that his brother did, and he would have met these people, including Oliver Wendell Holmes. This is significant because there's evidence that they were still friends as of 1842, that's when Charles Dickens came to Boston, and Oliver Wendell Holmes was involved in inviting Dickens to Boston and helping to arrange for the welcome dinner. That means that Matthew, almost 100% certainly, would have been given a personal introduction to Charles Dickens by his longtime friend, Oliver Wendell Holmes. See? So suddenly, the seemingly absurd idea that Matthew could have passed on a manuscript to Charles Dickens becomes absolutely, if not extremely likely, certainly plausible. See? So that's another element to this. So uh, we find this little tiny clue in here, which has some gigantic implications. So now I'm going to switch to the desktop view, and we're going to do our best to look at some of these. You should have my voice. If I understand correctly with this computer, it'll lag when I'm moving, but if I'm not moving, it should be uh, in sync. So we're going to switch over to the sources, to the desktop. 
Okay, we should have it now. We are now in the December 11, 1830 edition of the Constellation. You see the name of the paper up here. Now, the editorial section in this particular edition is completely taken up with the president's message, so we have no evidence there. However, we have a few pieces here. One of them, the first item here, is called Marrying for Money, and it's a dialogue between a couple fellows, Tom and Joe, and the gist of it is that uh, Joe has married for money and he's miserable and Tom chides him about it. Well, Matthew, at this point in his life, was very strongly identified with being a bachelor. And it's very typical for him. Uh, Matthew had previously written for the New England Galaxy before he moved to New York. There's any number of pieces that are typical of this uh, belief about the, the virtues of bachelorhood and the dangers of marriage. It's because he'd been burned in a romantic situation uh, with the girl that he was in love with before Abby. So he was a confirmed bachelor, as they say. Now here we have a little piece. This is also unsigned. It was just like fillers. It's called Characteristic of a Sailor. And this is just a little dialogue between two sailors. They dropped a hammer overboard and just, just before there was an earthquake and they're going to blame it on the earthquake. It's not one of his funniest pieces. But there's a phrase in here. And I wanted to point that out. Okay, I have highlighted the sentence. He says, Nor didn't I, muttered the first night of the Marlins Pike. Now that was one of Matthew's favorite phrases to uh, talk about a tailor as the knight of the shears and a writer as the knight of the quill. I don't know how common this was, but I do know that... Um, Matthew used this colloquialism 25 times in 25 different pieces over the course of his 54-year literary career. So that's just a little indication that we may, in fact, be dealing with Matthew Franklin Whittier here. Now, in this same edition of uh, December 11, 1830, we have a couple pieces here which are unsigned, I believe. The first one is called The Philosophy of Sleep. Now, Matthew was a philosopher. He identified himself as a philosopher, and he had insomnia. So this is a natural for him to be writing on. The second one is called The Nose of Wax, a Parisian anecdote. Matthew had a long nose. He was uh, somewhat sensitive about the fact that it was a long nose with a kind of bulbous end, and he very often wrote about noses. So this would also be a typical sign for him. I won't read these. I'm just kind of pointing out some elements that would suggest that the unnamed gentleman was, in fact, Matthew Franklin Whittier. So now we go into the second one, the December 18, 1830 edition. This is the front page. And we have something called The Philosopher. It's a series very typically, Matthew would start a series and there might be one or two and then he'd move on to something else. That was kind of his personality. Uh, this is number one, wisdom versus wit. Now, Matthew was a philosopher, but he was also a humorist. So these are his two primary focuses in his writing. And uh, this is done in a style that he will pick up again in the carpet bag in 1851 writing as a caricature of academia called E. Goethe Dig. But uh, here he's kind of using that same style. If I'm not mistaken, he uses a, f a term hebdominal, which he doesn't quite spell correctly because you see Matthew was uh, raised a farmer. He was a farmer's boy who had been given an education, but he still you know, spelling was not his long suit, so he would make spelling errors. I'm not sure where hebdominal is in here, but it's a word that he would also use when he wrote as Dr. Digg. So he would bring back his favorite characters and his favorite gags. So this is typical of Matthew, and this character is stuffy and intellectual, see? So that's the first one. And then there's somebody else's piece he has republished about the dualist. Well, when Matthew 
had his own newspaper briefly, he wrote about dueling also. So this was one of his topics. Here we have the second page, the editorial column of the December 18 edition. And it starts out with a story about a college joke. Now, Asa Green went to college. Matthew did not. But this is not Asa Green's work. We know because we've been told that some unnamed gentleman was writing the editorial material for these three editions. So this, this story about a college joke was not written by Asa Green, who had been to college. It was written by Matthew Franklin Whittier, who had not. Directly under that is a story about the New York horse. Now we see here that there's a quote it says, some things can be done as well as others, and it's signed Sam Patch. Now, if you've been watching these entries, that might be familiar to you. Sam Patch was a daredevil like Evil Knievel who would jump into waterfall canyons, and uh, Matthew quoted him in 1832, I think it's February, when he wrote his first published love poem to Abby, uh, to Miss Molly Blueberry. He signed it Sam Patch, and to the editor at the bottom, he quoted, quoted this same quote from Sam Patch, some things can be done as well as others. So, I mean, I'm 100% certain that that poem was Matthew's, and this is also Matthew here writing for the Constellation. So the story is actually pretty funny. It's about uh, uh, a horse in Boston that backed off the stage, and there was quite a bit of talk about that. But then there was a horse in New York City that went into an oyster shop, who went downstairs into the oyster shop and, and wreaked havoc, you know. And it's, it's very much in Matthew's typical style here, humorous style. Um, I'm going to read maybe the second paragraph here. Just to give you an idea, this is absolutely typical of Matthew Franklin Whittier's writing. And remember, I have 2,500 of his published works to compare to. No sooner, however, was this grand theatrical faux pas heard of here than one of our city horses, a horse of some sconce, an intellectual horse, as Willis would say, that's N.P. Willis, determined to distance the Bostonian, while standing in Broadway, quote, chewing the cud of sweet and bitter fancy and ruminating upon the president's message and things in general, the idea popped into his head that he would just pop down into an oyster cellar on the Canal Street plan and regale himself to a plate. Turning round his head, he espied over the testosterous repository at the corner of Fulton Street the motto, in letters large enough for a horse to read, live and let live. Whether entertainment for man and beast was below, he did not stop to inquire. The motto was a broad one, and giving a broad horse laugh, down he bolted. Now this this uh, reference to entertainment for man and beast, that's a phrase that they used to use back in the 1700s, and that basically that sign used to hang in front of the tavern that became the house that Abby grew up in. So he would have been familiar with that sign um, in Elliot's Tavern in Rock's Village in East Haverhill, Massachusetts. There were probably other places that had that sign as well, taverns, but he definitely knew of the one in Rock's Village, so that's a personal reference. But anyway, that's Matthew Franklin Whittier's writing style, definitely. And remember, see, historians have assumed all this work was written by Asa Green, and therefore they call Asa Green a humorist. Well, Asa Green was not the humorist. It was the man writing for him, the unnamed gentleman, Matthew Franklin Whittier. Now take a look at the extreme bottom right corner. And this is the two correspondence column. All newspapers had a little column where the editor could uh, speak to people who had submitted material to the paper or just to anybody in general. So it says, we are much obliged to quote the philosopher for his lucubrations. May we not expect a continuation of his favors? W must excuse us for omitting this week his story of the, quote, dandy in distress. Its length prevented an insertion without deranging our columns. The satire is capital, and we shall take great pleasure in presenting it to our readers next week. And then he goes on about a couple other things, quips and quavers. 
Now, there's many times that I've run across evidence which seems to contradict my theories, you know, and, and your, your heart just sinks. It's like, oh, I was wrong about all of this. Well, no, this is because Matthew had this tricky habit of playing all these different roles, of wearing all these different hats. So he would write material as though it was coming in from outside, and then he would comment on it as the editor, see, as though it was somebody else. Well, no, that, that story, The Dandy in Distress, that's obviously Matthew's work, and this is one of his favorite topics as dandies. So W is for Whittier, that is Matthew, and he's writing about himself or to himself as though it was somebody else. And the same thing goes with the philosopher. Now, this is when Matthew could toot his own horn. It's the only way and the only time that Matthew ever tooted his horn, and he did it quite loudly when he could hide and pretend that he was speaking of someone else. Quips and quavers, apparently there were several young men who were contributing to the paper at this time. You, you can see that because there's, you know, where quips and quavers started, you can see that it was a group. So it was a group that I think Matthew was part of that were submitting to the paper early on in 1830 before he began editing it. So, you know, slur is, is italicized. It apparently has a double meaning, but I don't know what it is. But anyway, this is just another example, and there are quite a few examples of this, of Matthew playing different roles and wearing different hats and pretending to be submitting to his own paper and then pretending to be commenting on these other people as the editor. Now we are in the last page from the December 18, 1830 edition that I'm going to read. This is called Poor Devils. It's uh, unsigned. This is written, again, by the unnamed gentleman. It's an editorial piece. But uh, this is very interesting because the second paragraph describes Basically, it describes Ebenezer Scrooge. And remember, we are now in 1830. We're now 13 years before Charles Dickens published A Christmas Carol. This 1830, this is roughly the same time that Matthew would have written The New Year's Bells, which was the template that he and Abby used to write A Christmas Carol, which was stolen by Francis Duravage, which ended up published in 1853 in a book called The Three Brides, Love in a Cottage, and Other Tales, which was a compilation of Matthew Franklin Whittier's stories stolen by Francis Duravage and published by him many years later. But the next to last story in that book called The New Year's Bells was the template that Matthew Franklin Whittier and Abby Poyan Whittier started from when they started working on A Christmas Carol in 1838. But we're going to read a description of Scrooge. There is another class of men who deserve neither our commiseration, sympathy, nor pity, who are miserable by choice and of no value in society. We allude to those who have lived a life of penurious celibacy until the property amassed by niggardly savings and self-mortifying deprivations hovers over them by day and by night in visions of distrust, disquietude, and fear. These are they who never listen to the petition of the widow nor the cry of the orphan, whose charities end where they began at home, if he may be said to have a home, who has no feelings in community with the world nor its families. We have one such in our mind's eye at this moment. He is a man who neither indulges in the vicious nor the innocent pleasures of the age. His life is as regular and monotonous as an eight-day clock. He is punctual in waking and rising, punctual in lying down and sleeping, punctual at breakfast, punctual at his desk, and the performance of his regular duties, punctual at church, except when there is to be a collection, and then he is suddenly indisposed, punctual in disappearance at another's dinner table, and most dilatory in making a return. And it goes on like that. In 1830, Matthew Franklin Whittier, as the unnamed gentleman who is editing this edition of the Constellation, is describing Ebenezer Scrooge very much as he did in the New Year's Bells, where he was called Israel Worm in that case. 
Now we have the third of the editions, which were edited by the unnamed gentleman who continued to quote unquote assist. December 25, this is Christmas 1830. And on the front page, you see the, the publishers up here, Lord and Bartlett. On the front page is a long story about Mr. Augustus Fitz Whisker or the dandy in distress. Now, Matthew was raised Quaker. Quakers dress plainly, speak plainly. What is the antithesis of a Quaker? A dandy in the big city. So Matthew wrote disparagingly about dandies. And this is obviously Matthew Franklin Whittier's work based on style. And again, I have 2,500, more than 2,500 of Matthew Franklin Whittier's published works to compare with. I know this is his. Do I need to read anything in this? I think you can stop the video and read this yourself if you're so inclined. Again, this is just absolutely typical of his style. I haven't looked through it for Matthew's favorite words. I wouldn't be surprised if there were some phrases or words of his that were his favorites, but uh, we're going to move on here. We are now looking at the editorial page. By the way, the uh, previous story that I just mentioned, it's signed W, which is kind of interesting. Now, his, this guy's last name is Whisker, you know, but Matthew's last name is Whittier. So this is one of the rare instances where Matthew was actually signed with his last initial. I don't think he would do that in later years, but this is still pretty early, 1830. Now, we have a little note here, by the way, uh, an editorial note. And it says, we owe an apology to our subscribers for the late and irregular delivery of the Constellation for a few weeks past. Those who do not in future receive it before Saturday evening are requested to give immediate information at the office in order that all such omissions may be corrected. What this means is that Matthew was in charge of editing while Asa Green was away, but he was not in charge of distribution. And therefore, the distribution had kind of fallen off and gotten disorganized while Asa Green was away. And Matthew, as the acting editor, is apologizing for that. Now, immediately underneath, we see a fit of agitation, New York police. And this is a little story of a man who was abusing an alcoholic who was abusing his wife. And it's written quite sympathetically for the wife. And this is in an era before women's rights. So Matthew was using humor, but he was advocating for women who were being abused. And it's typical of his style, but this is also based on reporting of the police office. Now, when Matthew returns to Asa Green's third newspaper, the New York Transcript, one of his main assignments at that time was to cover the arraignment hearings. And uh, he did it in a rather humorous style. This is kind of a precursor to that work that he did a few years later, two, three years later for the transcript. But it's typical of all of those pieces. And he did this again in 1846 after he left the New York Tribune. He went down to New Orleans and he worked for the Daily Delta and he did exactly the same thing. That first summer he worked for the Daily Delta, he signed with his middle initial F. It reads exactly the same as these, this one, and it reads exactly the same as the ones in the New York transcript in 1835. So this is typical of Matthew's work. Now over here on the right, immediately afterwards, we have, or not immediately afterwards, but immediately next to it, we have Adventures of a Clerk. It starts out with a quote. It uh, goes on about clerking. And Matthew had a dual career at this time. He was trying to pursue a mercantile career at the same time that he was writing for the Constellation. He started out as a clerk and later on went to uh, be partners in, in a trading firm. Now, I want to show you briefly a couple of things. These are a couple of the novels that Matthew wrote when he stopped working for the Constellation. Apparently, he moved back to Boston and he wrote these five novels. They've all been mistakenly attributed by scholars to Asa Green. And probably because scholars have gone back, like this is a reprint. I can't afford an original of this is as much as six and a half thousand dollars. You know, and I think a couple people that worked on Wall Street bid it up. And so now all of Asa Green's work is like in the hundreds or even thousands of dollars. 
So this is a nice reprint, but this is one of those books. Asa Green's name is nowhere on this. I can prove that all of these books were by Matthew Franklin Whittier. This one is basically very roughly autobiographical. It's taken from Matthew's own experiences in the trading world of New York City, see? But this is an original of The Debtor's Prison, A Tale of a Revolutionary Soldier. And I think my copy was, was uh, not a first edition. I think mine is 1835. It was published in 1834. There is what it looks like. Again, this is way, way before Charles Dickens was writing anything like this. Now we're going to go back to our uh, newspapers. There's one that I missed from the Christmas edition, the uh, December 25, 1830 edition. And that is a response to the philosopher who wrote about wisdom versus wit. This is signed Sad Fellow. And this guy takes the opposite uh, argument. He argues for uh, sober wisdom as opposed to wit, and he is a sad fellow. This is Matthew answering his own editorial, okay? This is not someone who wrote into the paper, despite the fact that he says, dear editor, in his opening. This is Matthew writing to himself, basically, in the editorial column. He will do exactly the same thing in his own newspaper in 1838, the Salisbury Monitor. So this is definitely an indication of Matthew. Now there's another little editorial about passion. This is probably also written by Matthew, but this is serious, this is serious philosophy. And this was typical of Matthew that he would cover himself with humor. So he would write a piece that was tongue in cheek, and then he would slip in his actual writing, his actual philosophy, his actual essay, or he would write a humorous, silly poem. He even wrote like a poem that says, well, I can't write poetry, you know, and then anonymously he writes the real poem, see, so that was typical of him. So this is a very strong indication that it was Matthew Franklin Whittier, who was the unnamed assistant who was taking over the paper for three editions, December 11, December 18, and December 25, 1830, as the publishers indicated. And in fact, he was really the editor of this paper. And again, I believe that Asa Green was primarily, although he was officially the editor, editor-in-chief, he was running his bookstore. And Matthew at age 18 and 19, you know, Matthew is 18 years old here, you know, and he's running the paper. I think it would have been an embarrassment to admit that a teenager was running his paper, you know, never mind that he was a prodigy and so on. So I think he was kind of kept under wraps and never really mentioned. And Matthew preferred it that way. He didn't want to be brought to the public's attention. Now, as to the question, was Charles Dickens influenced by this work that Matthew Franklin Whittier was writing anonymously for the Constellation? I was able to follow it this far. And that is that the British Library has a complete run of the New York Constellation, you know, from this era. And then the question is, well, how did they get it and who gave it to them and when? Well, logically, if somebody had in their possession a full run of bound volume or volumes of this newspaper and they lived in America, they lived in New York City or somewhere nearby, they would have donated it to a New York institution, a New York library or something else in New York or somewhere in the United States, they would not have shipped it over to London. See, it makes no sense. Therefore, whoever donated it to the British Library had to have lived in England and probably in London. Then the question is, well, how did they get it? And who, who bound it? See, so it means that it was available at least by subscription. And that's what the library told me. It was definitely available by subscription at the time. Uh, it would be sent over. It'd take maybe a week and a half or a couple weeks to get over there, you know, something like that. Um, whether it was available in reading rooms, I don't know. Uh, they, they couldn't confirm that, that it was available in reading rooms. There were public reading rooms, but whether it was available there, we don't know, but it definitely was available by subscription. Did Charles Dickens have a subscription or know somebody that had a subscription to the Constellation? That's the gap 
in the evidence. We don't know that. We don't know that he read the paper. We don't know that he had access to it. But if he had access to it, and if he read it, Matthew Franklin Whittier's work is all through this newspaper, The Constellation. He would definitely have been influenced. And this was before Charles Dickens published, see, 1830. So, uh, it's a stronger clue than it looks like. And here's the truth. If I was working it the other way around, you know, if I said, well, Matthew Franklin Whittier wasn't influenced by Charles Dickens, and it turned out that Dickens had started publishing first, and Matthew could have seen it, that would be enough for skeptics to wipe the whole thing out, see. But they're hypocritical. They won't go the other way. Even though it's quite possible that Charles Dickens could have read the New York Constellation, they won't jump on that and say, oh, that proves it, see? So there's a disconnect there in terms of what your biases are. But anyway, that's the little teensy-weensy clue that I found in the uh, New York Constellation and the implications that proceed from it.